Did you let it tell you that you forgot to turn it on? Yes, I actually got a message asking, asking where it was, and, uh, which is why I turned it on about 20 minutes into it last week, because a little message popped up on my phone there and it told me that, hey, uh, where are you? <laughs> uh, but again, uh, welcome again to Sabbath School here at Bethany R.P. as we go to Mark chapter 7 today, uh, as we continue in our uh, winter quarterly. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark. But uh, before we get into all that, let's go ahead and open word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, that you've guided us unto this place on this day. And to God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us as we study your word, as we learn more about the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we see uh, what he has called us to be and to do as his people. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, today, uh, again, we'll be in Mark 7. But before we do that, let's go ahead and do our catechism questions for the day. Uh, we'll be in uh, question 33 and 34 of the catechism. Uh, question 33, what is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Question 34, what is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. Amen. Now, you know, justification, uh, of course, is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. You know, this is kind of the chief cornerstone of what we believe, of uh, the nature of our faith, of how we come to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and especially what we believe about what Jesus did at the cross. And the key word that we need to pay attention to, right, there's two key words in here that we pay attention to. First of all, that justification is an act of God's free grace. You know, it is something that God gives to us. It's not something we earn. It's not something that we have to be in a position to receive. Uh, it's not something that we gain uh, by as uh, uh, John says in John chapter 1, by the flesh or by the blood, uh, but by the spirit. And the means by which justification is applied to us is uh, that it is imputed to us, right? The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. Now, imputation is one of those big words that's important for us to understand uh, because there's, this is the major difference between us and uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, you know, some uh, what we call Arminian churches, you know, the means by which we are saved you know, and how we receive the grace and righteousness of Christ. What we understand to happen in justification is that this grace is imputed to us. Now, you know, you have impute, Im, imputed righteousness, you have imparted righteousness, and you have infused righteousness. Now, you know, the Roman Catholics are big on what we call infused righteousness. And uh, any of y'all who have had an infusion uh, know exactly what that means, all right? You know, when you get an infusion, right, you have a little bag set up and you get, you know, a little, you get stuck and then you sit there until it empties itself into you. Well, that's what the Roman Catholics believe about grace, that grace is literally uh, brought into you by the sacraments of the church. So when you, uh, when, when you take the Lord's Supper, for example, when you go to Mass, you are receiving grace by infusion. Like you're literally eating the body and blood uh, of the Lord. And so as you take it in, you are kind of having your grace meter go up. Well, you know, if you've ever walked in a Roman Catholic church, I'm sure you've seen the stand of candles that are on the side, right? And one of the things you do there is you not only go, you know, light a candle for grandma or whatever, but you go there to light a candle for a particular saint to intercede on your behalf, right? If you're getting ready to go on a big trip, right, you go talk to St. Joseph. And, you know, St. Joseph will watch over you and provide you with grace in the midst of whatever it is that you're doing. And so you're, that's infused into you, okay? It, it, it kind of, in a sense, grace flushes out the bad stuff, 
Okay, so uh, that's not what we understand grace does. Now, the other option is it's imparted to us. Now, impartation means that it is uh, a gift, right? And we believe that grace is a gift. But in this case, it's as if um, UPS is delivering grace to you, right? It's uh, brought to you and given to you, and you just kind of hold on to it, right? It's, it's just a, a gift. Now, imputation, what we believe, is that the righteousness of Christ is not just given to us, but it becomes ours. Right? It is, you know, on the day of judgment, when we're standing in front of the uh, seat uh, of judgment, and Jesus Christ is looking at us, and we're being judged for our good works, right? and, we're, and Jesus is looking at us, what he sees is the righteousness that he has made ours. And so we present righteousness to Christ in the day of judgment that has our name on it, okay? Now, did we do anything to get that grace? No, we didn't, we didn't do anything, we didn't earn it in any way, but it's ours, okay? So that's in a very brief, you know, truncated way, right? That's what the, the catechism here is talking about when it talks about imputation, okay? The righteousness of Christ is ours, right? It's our righteousness. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything to get it, but it's ours, and it has our name on it, and that's part of what question 34, what is adoption, is all about, right? You know, we're all familiar with what adoption is in the real world, right? You are a child. You're either an uh, orphan, or for some reason, you become a ward of the state. And you go through a legal process where the state recognizes that you belong to another family. And as part of that process, one of the things they do is legally change your name. And you get a new last name, right? You become part of a new family. And it's not just a, well, you're staying with them, right? There's a difference between being a foster child and being adopted, well, when we talk about this in relation to our justification and to the faith that we receive, we are not just living in the master's house. Right? We're not servants of the master. We are servants in a sense, but we're not like servants. We are as much the children of the house as the native-born uh, children. Right? We have just the same rights as native-born children, right? There's no difference between us and native-born children, right? We are adopted into the house of God, and we have all the privileges and the rights of being uh, the, the sons of the living and the true God. Um, and, of course, adoption, just like justification, is an act of God's free grace, right? You, you don't lobby to become a part of the family of God. Right? You don't stand outside the courthouse and say, pick me, uh, I want to be part of your family, right? No, the Lord our God has sent the Holy Spirit to take you out of the family of the devil and bring you into the house of the Lord. And so there's a reason why, again, adoption follows justification, right? We've been given the righteousness of Christ, right? We have been made new creatures. We have been given new life. And now one of the benefits that flows from that is adoption, that we're made members of the household. And if we've been made members of the household, can anyone take that away from us? No. Right? It is as certain as anything humanly possible. Right? One way the uh, book of Revelation talks about this is that when we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive a mark. Right? Not literally, right? We don't have tattoos on our forehead, right? We're, we're not like you know, Hindus. We don't have a little red dot right here, right? It's not a visible mark, but it's a mark that is seen both by the devil and by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He knows who are his, and there's no removing that mark, right? You can't take it off, and nobody can take it from you, right? It, it, it is as much you as anything else. And so justification and adoption, right, are central to our faith, you know, because if these things are not true, then do we have any hope, right? We have no hope, right? Because uh, if we're just free agents running around, 
Um, whose team are we going to be on when the draft is over? Right? On the devil's team, right? Um, if we, you know, we're, we're not going to be a member of the, of the team on the right side, right? We'll be on the left side. And we'll go ahead and stop on that and go ahead and go into our, our, our lesson for today. Uh, our lesson uh, comes with Mark chapter 7. Uh, we, you know, have just completed, um, you know, in chapter five, the scene where we have uh, Jesus healing and we have uh, Jesus uh, uh, setting uh, the storm. And then in chapter six, we have the whole scene with Jesus uh, being rejected at Nazareth. Uh, he again goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach. And remember, what, what do they say about Jesus in Nazareth? Isn't this Joseph's son, right? Who does he think he is to get up in the pulpit and tell us what, what, what God would have us to believe? Right? He, he is not recognized for his authority in his own town. And of course, Jesus in verse four, chapter six says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Right? That is... Again, Jesus testifying the fact that he's basically been rejected in Nazareth. Now, we, uh, you know, we're not told here in Mark, but in Matthew's account of this, remember, what do the people of Nazareth try to do to Jesus? They try to throw him off the cliff. Remember, the mob comes and drags him to the, to, to the, to the cliff at Nazareth and wants to throw him off. And what does Jesus do? He just walked through the crowd, right? Uh, they had no power over him. And uh, so he leaves. And then we get the scene in Mark 6 with John the Baptist being beheaded. We hear about, you know, the wickedness involved with that. And then the feeding of the 5,000. And now we are uh, in a scene where Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes. You know, they've heard of his fame heard of all the stuff that he's been doing. So now they come to talk to him. And so we see there in Mark 7, verse 1, then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees, scribes, and scribes asked him, Why do disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? All right, this is you know, a story that we know well. I'm sure you've probably heard somebody talk about this a hundred times. Uh, but the... You know, the scene is very important for us to pay attention to, again, the background details of what's happening here, right? The Pharisees and the scribes are beginning to do what they're going to do for the whole rest of Jesus' earthly ministry, which is try to get Jesus in trouble, either with the law of Moses or with the law of the elders, right? The traditions of the elders, Right? We've already seen that with the Sabbath. You know, they, they tried to tell Jesus that it was unlawful to heal on the Sabbath. And is it wrong to heal on the Sabbath? No. Right? It's okay to do works of necessity and mercy on the Lord's Day. And that includes working at the hospital or being a fireman or doing whatever. Right? And so Jesus, whenever he's confronted by the Pharisees and scribes on these matters always goes back to the word of God. He always goes back to, to the law of Moses, to the prophets, and he shows them that they neither understand the Bible nor do they understand what God is doing with the law. And so the situation here is that they have this tradition. They wash their hands in a special way. Right? And that's what this is all about. You know, again, it's not about the washing of hands, right? Um, should you wash your hands before you eat? Yes. Uh, and uh, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. 
right? You know, don't let your kids read this and say, uh, Jesus says, I don't have to wash my hands. Uh, he says, that's a tradition of men, and I don't have to follow that, right? That's, that's not what's happening here. Uh, but they have a special way that they wash their hands. And they do that, again, because they understand that all things are dirty. And not dirty in the sense that they're, they're, they're dirty, but that they're unclean, right? And so everything has to be cleansed before it can go in the body. And so not only do they wash their hands, but we're told that they wash cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Now, when we hear couch here, what are we to understand? Right, remember, how did they eat back then? Recliner, right? So they, they clean the, the chairs, basically, where they sit at the table, right, and eat. So they go and they do all these things in order that it all might be made ready for eating. And so, uh, again, one of the things the Pharisees always do is they always take the law of God as it's given and take it a couple steps further. And the point of that is so that, the, uh, that, that you don't even have a chance to break the law because you'd have to break three or four Pharisee laws before you even got to the law of God. Now, does God need our help when it comes to the law? No, right? God does not need us to make up laws to try to help people not to break the law. Uh, you know, the Pharisees would have done very well today, right? They would have been, they would have been wonderful employees of federal department of whatever, right? Because what, what, what do federal departments love to do? Make laws, right? Make regulations, make up things, right? And one of the purposes of their making up regulations is so that you don't break the law, right? So you, you're protecting right, their desire, right? Their mindset is that, well, we need to protect them from themselves. So we need to make all these rules and regulations. And, and what does that do? It just confuses everything. It makes everything harder and... It also takes all the joy out of doing anything because you have to fill things out in triplicate and you have to go to this office and you got to do this paperwork and you got to go to that. And by the time you get all that done, you know, what usually happens? Right, they change it, right? They change it or they forgot to give you a piece of paper to fill out so you have to start the process all over again. Well, you know, that is the main problem with the Pharisees and the scribes. They are causing the people to hate the Lord because of their many rules and regulations, right? There's a, a very direct similarity between what the Pharisees and the scribes do and what Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, did in 1 Samuel, right? Remember, God had made an apportion for the Levites and the priests, they were allowed to take a portion of the sacrifice for themselves. And, but what Hophni and Phinehas had started to do was they said, well, what God's given to us is not sufficient, so we need to take more from people. And as they started taking more, they decided, well, you know, God had given me the hindquarters, but what I really want is the prime rib. And so I'm going to start taking that from the people. And it got to the point in Israel that Nobody wanted to go to the temple. Nobody wanted to go to the tabernacle. Nobody wanted to worship the Lord because to worship the Lord, who did you have to deal with? Right? Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, and so you just didn't bother. You just didn't go. Right? So they caused the people of God to hate sacrifice, to, to hate to come before the Lord. And so that's obviously a big problem, right? Because what does the Lord desire? Right? That we come and we worship him. And... So the, the message of Mark 7 is really about the warning towards men to do not introduce anything into the life of God's people other than what God has told you to do. And why is that so hard for us to follow? <laughs> right? We always think we got to do more. Right? And we also have a tendency to think that we're wiser than God is. Right? That, that we know better than God. We see this especially in worship. Um, 
you know, one of the one of the great reasons for the whole Protestant Reformation was that by the time the 1500s roll around, you know, what what is worship like for your average Christian? First of all, what language is it in? <laughs> right, it's in Latin. Um, so you, you have no idea what's happening, right? Second of all, who who's actually doing stuff in worship? Right, the priest is. You're not actually doing anything. You're just kind of witnessing him do everything. You know, it, it, it's, it, it would be like if you would come here on the Lord's Day morning and... And, you know, I would be talking to the wall back here and doing all kinds of stuff. And then I'd turn around and say, it's done, and y'all would leave. All right. It, 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 does that sound like something you'd want to come do every Sunday? All right. Because you don't, you don't need to be here for it. All right. Because the priest is doing everything, and you're kind of getting the showers of his mm-hmm. blessings. Um, and so, not only that, but... There's also all kinds of ritual involved in that. There's all kinds of stuff that happens. And as you know, it, it's one of the reasons why one of the first things that guys like uh, you know, Heinrich Zwingli and, and John Calvin did is they stripped away all of the excess stuff. Right? They took away the fancy dress. Right? So no longer do I have to wear 15 layers of clothes up here and have it be you know, lined with gold and all that kind of stuff. I mean, on one hand, that sounds kind of neat, right, to have, <laughs> have fancy clothes to wear. But, um, you know, traditionally, you know, when they got into the pulpit, you know, what, what were Calvin and, and those guys wearing? Just a black robe, right? And the reason for that was is it was because that was what they wore during the week. Right? They were academics, right? You know, Calvin taught... Uh, you know, you and and that kind of thing. So he just wore what he normally wore. Now it got to be kind of a tradition thing. So um, you know, what did ministers start wearing after all that? Right, big black robes. Right, and it's you know, it it kind of lost its whole meaning and just kind of became one of them things. Uh, now you can wear a robe. I don't really care. But uh, the I wore one the whole time I was in Mississippi, um, and it's kind of fun to have a big flowing thing flap around in. But um, the idea was is that our worship needs to be what God has told us to do in his worship. You know, we don't need to help God worship himself. And so after you get rid of all the stuff, you know, what are you left with? You're left with preaching, praying, scripture reading, and singing. Right? There's four elements and obviously the sacraments, right? The Lord's Supper and Baptism. But, you know, on an ordinary service, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to hear from God. You're supposed to talk to God. And you're supposed to listen to God, right? And what means by which has God given to us to do that? Right? Right, right here. Right? We're, we're to proclaim what God has given to us. And we don't need to add anything to that. That's the simplicity of Protestant worship. Now, we get in trouble when we start adding all kinds of man-made stuff to it, right? Now, the problem with man-made stuff is that sometimes it's it's very pretty. It's very well done. Um, But again, does God need our help? No, right? And one of the reasons for that, too, is when we think about it, if we have all kinds of extra stuff, you know, how easy is it to worship? Right. It, it's not easy because what do you have to do? You have to do a lot of preparation. You have to do a lot of organizing. You have to do a lot of committee work and all that kind of stuff. When the reality is, is that if you just do what God says, what do you need to worship? Nothing, right? You just need a Bible. Right? You just need you just need your Bible. You just need the word of the Lord. Right? You don't need a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, when we think of our covenanter uh, forefathers, right? When they were being chased around, you know, the lowlands of Scotland by the you know the troops, 
they were still able to worship the Lord, right? Because what did, what did they use in worship? The Bible, right? They sang the Bible, they read the Bible, and they preached the Bible, right? They didn't need anything else, right? You couldn't lug around a, a smoke machine with you, right, into the, into the you know, the, the caves, right? The nice thing about the caves, right, they came with a built-in smoke system, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, right? But, right, you didn't need laser light shows, you, you know, you didn't need all kinds of fancy equipment, right? You didn't need any of that stuff, right? Because to worship the Lord, all you need is the Bible. And that's what Jesus is trying to get across to the Pharisees and the, the scribes here. Because notice what he says to them in verse 6. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written. Now, this is one of these cases where we see Jesus being nice and winsome and, and nuanced, right? Uh, <laughs> what does Jesus call them immediately? Hypocrites. Now, if somebody walked up to you and called you a hypocrite, how would you take that? Not well, right? You'd probably be a little offended by that. Um, and we've already seen that, you know, how have the, how have the scribes and Pharisees received the teaching of Jesus? Right? It makes them mad, right? They don't like it. And so now, not only has he called them hypocrites, he then reads to them from Isaiah 29 13 a prophecy that Isaiah gave against the false prophets of his day. And so he's called them hypocrites and now he associates them with the false prophets of, uh, of Judah. Um, he, ain't meant, he ain't mentioning words here, right? He ain't beating around the bush. He's being very direct with them. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition, right? You know, if you ever want to cause trouble in a church, <laughs> what do you do? You start messing with traditions, right? You start messing with, with things that um, are held dear. Uh, and it's especially true when we start talking about worship. You know, when we start talking about things that are done in worship. Um, you know, one of the strange things, the unique things, I guess, about uh, Protestant worship, especially after the Second World War, is that a lot of traditions came in that weren't actually traditions. You know, they were kind of made up on the spot. Uh, but they became, you know, what good Christian people did. Um, now, I'm going to step on some toes here. Uh, we don't do this here, so it's a, I, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here. But uh, a good, good example of this is the, um, is, is the Advent wreath. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know what that is, right? Advent wreath with the candles and stuff. That literally did not exist prior to 1900. Um, it was a, a Victorian invention, um, and it wasn't adopted in Presbyterian circles until the 40s and 50s. And part of the reason for that is because the servicemen who had gone off to war, well, the worship services that they would have in camps and stuff like that was generic Protestant worship. And so what they did in these worship services is that they just kind of took parts of you know, Methodist worship and Lutheran worship and Presbyterian worship and just kind of threw it all together. And so when everybody came back from the war, you know, what were they used to? Right? These traditions that had been introduced, and so they started becoming a normal part of, you know, kind of generic Protestant worship. And so the distinctives of Presbyterian worship, for example, were kind of lost in that post-war era because of that. Now, you know, I'm not saying that if you have an Advent wreath, you're a hypocrite and a <laughs> teaching the doctrines of men, but that's an example of how tra so-called traditions kind of get into a church. And, you know, I can only imagine trying to get rid of something like an Advent wreath. 
Uh, because there's a lot of emotion tied into things like that. But again, do we have any biblical example of such things? No, right? There's a simplicity again to Presbyterian worship and to, to, to pro should be to Protestant worship that we ought to be able to do everything in worship regardless of the world situation that we're in. Right? We shouldn't need all kinds of extra stuff, okay? And that's part of what Jesus wants to, 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 to clarify here in the new covenant because in the old covenant, what did you need to worship? Right? You needed a priest. You needed a uh, you needed you know all the accoutrements of the of the temple of the tabernacle. Right? You needed the bronze labor. You needed all that stuff. But in the new covenant, what do we need? We need Jesus. Right? That, that's all we need to worship. Right? Jesus is the fulfillment of all that stuff. Now the book of Hebrews is filled with examples of. You know, and, and the epistles of Paul, too, are filled with examples of this fight that's happening in the early church. Because what, is, what do some of the Jews want to, to do? Right? Continue the traditions of the Old Covenant. They're not necessarily wanting to continue the Pharisaical stuff, but they're wanting to continue circumcision. They're wanting to continue um, you know, the, um, the dietary laws, you know, the mixing of fabrics, all that kind of stuff. And in Galatia, in uh, Colossia, in Colossae, and in the book of Hebrews, uh, Paul is very clear to tell us that all of that stuff has passed away. Because if you still circumcise, if you're still taking dietary laws, what does that say about what Christ has done? It's not enough, right? You need these other things to set you apart. But Jesus, again, is as clear as he possibly could be in this passage uh, it, when he says, um, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a, a house away from the crowd, the disciples asked him to turn his parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. <laughs> you know, this is one of these uh, statements of Jesus that, uh, uh, you know, I can't imagine saying this in, in uh, polite company. <laughs> but, right, Jesus is being as clear as he possibly can be, right? You eat food, and it's eliminated, right? You know, it has done nothing to you other than give you nutrients, right? It's not, there's nothing special about it. And so again, he says, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil lie, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man, Right? You know, Jesus is telling us again that in the new covenant, right, all those old covenant things have passed away. Right? Jesus here is declaring that all food is clean. And that means, right, you can eat bacon and you can uh, you eat shellfish and you can go to Charleston and have a good old time. Right? Because Jesus has come and laid down his life. Uh, and so if somebody tells you that good Christians don't eat this, what can you say? It's not what goes into you that defiles you, what comes out, right? Now, you know, so for instance, one of the things, it's interesting uh, to me at least, uh, in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy, one of the things that, Pete, or that Paul warns Timothy about, that in the days to come, what's going to happen? People are going to come and tell you, don't eat this, don't touch this. Don't do this. And what are you to say to them? Who are you to tell me that? Because Jesus, again, has freed us from the law. Now, again, go back in history a little bit. Um, you know, 
you know, before Vatican II, you know, if you're Roman Catholic, what can't you eat on a Friday? Right? Meat, right? You can't eat meat on a Friday. Now, Vatican II has made it so it's just during Lent, right? You're not supposed to eat meat. But before Vatican II, it was every Friday, 365 days a year, you weren't supposed to eat meat. Now, the workaround of that is what kind of meat would they eat on Friday? Fish, right? Now, one of the nice things about living in Pittsburgh, which is a heavily Roman Catholic city, was that during Lent, what did every Roman Catholic church in town have? A fish fry, right? For like a month, for 40 days, they would have a fish fry. And it was, you know, and the different Roman Catholic churches would compete against each other. And, you know, St. Cecilia's by far had the best uh, battle. And I, I must admit that I plundered from the Egyptians <laughs> and uh, enjoyed myself quite a, quite a, quite a bit uh, in that. Um, but... Again, does anyone have a right to tell you when to eat things and when not to eat things? No. Right? You've been freed from the strictures of the law when it comes to these outward things. Because another problem with the outward things, being focused on outward things, is what doesn't get paid attention to? The inward things, right? If you're so focused on doing all the outward stuff right, are you spending any time focusing on the spirit? No. Right? And what do we see out of legalists all the time? Right? They are as clean as humanly possible on the outside, right? They, they don't drink, they don't smoke, and they don't go with girls who do, right? But what's their spiritual life look like? Right? It's a mess, Because right? they're so focused on the outward things that they're not working on the spirit. And of course, what do we see from the Pharisees? Are they able to understand anything Jesus is saying? No, right? And why are they not able to understand? Because they have a problem with him not washing his hands before he eats. Instead of listening to the words that he is saying, right? Because the words that he's saying, where are the words going? Right? Into your ear, in your head, and right back out. Right? Because that's not what they're focused on, right? They're focused on these outward things. And that's an important thing for us to remember as Christians. Now, there are obviously outward things we need to pay attention to, right? Um, you know, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy that he needs to make sure that the women dress modestly, right? And that's obviously an outward thing. But you notice there, the point that Paul is making to Timothy there is that modesty is not in and of itself the goal, right? Modesty is an expression of an inward reality, right? A recognition of the heart, right? Just like lots of other things that we could probably discuss this morning. But so again, kind of to close out here, and we'll, we'll end on this, is again, Jesus is, is very hyper-focused in his earthly ministry about reminding people of what really matters, right? It is the nature of the heart. Now, what comes out of the heart is going to be good if the heart is in the right place. But you can be outwardly good all you want to, but that's not going to get you into heaven. Right? There's a lot of good outwardly Christian people who are in hell today because they did not you know, have a heart relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that's, that has to be something we always have to keep in mind because within all of us, what is that? You know, a little Pharisee just waiting, <laughs> waiting to come out, right? So we have to kind of suppress our, our Pharisaical instincts at times. So we'll close on that. Any questions or comments or anything? All right, well, let's go ahead and close the prayer. Great study, Father. We give thanks again uh, for the uh, time you give to us to study your word, to think through some of the, uh, you know, deeper things and the applications of some of the stuff Jesus has to teach us. And so, dear God, we pray that your hand would be upon us, the Holy Spirit would continue to strive with us, that we might more and more every day uh, be more in conformity to the Lord Jesus and what he would have us to do. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.